So welcome to lecture two of machine learning hardware and systems. Um, this is the lecture where we'll really dive into some of the important uh, hardware and computer architecture concepts uh, when designing a, a DNN accelerator. Uh, and so the lecture turned out to be so long that I, I booked the whole week for it. So we will start on it today, uh, see how far we get, and then we'll continue um, in the next lecture. So. Okay. So some admin things out of the way. Uh, so there were a few people on the waiting list. Um, I asked to student services to just add them to the course. So if anyone is uh, still on the waiting list um, and they would like to take this course, um, just let me know. I don't think it should be a problem. Um, so A0 is due next week. So again, A0 is just kind of a warm up exercise to get you used to the Google Colab and GitHub and mounting Google Drive and all of that stuff. So it's, it doesn't really have any meat. So just make sure um, you ask any questions you have about these tools. So by the time you're done by, with A0, you know how to use these uh, tools and software uh, and you have no questions about them because then uh, A1 will come and then A2, which is really uh, long and difficult. And so uh, you should be ready uh, and not kind of have problems with these things um, by then. So opportunity to ask questions. Uh, paper summaries. Uh, so the first paper summary was due before this class. Um, so again, even if you don't write the summary, make sure to read the paper. It kind of complements the lecture. And um, without it, you're getting an incomplete picture of, of what's going on. Um, finally, instant access. So there's something called instant access. It's a legitimate Cornell thing where they um, get you to pay for money to access textbooks. Um, in, the, in our case, uh, our, the textbook is free. Um, but if you don't opt out of this instant access thing, uh, you pay like $70 or something. Uh, so there's an ed post about it, an ed discussion post about it. Just go there and figure out how to opt out. I think some people did it successfully. I've also emailed them to just remove um, this from the course because the textbook is free. Um, but yeah, let me know if you have any issues with that. So. Okay, so where are we? Um, so in the previous lecture, we uh, started developing this mental model of, um, of a hardware accelerator. And we largely based it on von Neumann architectures, and we, uh, which means that we have a compute element, we have a memory element, they're connected through uh, a low bandwidth bus, um, and this is what's typically called the von Neumann bottleneck. So what we do, uh, we kind of add on-chip memory to get around that, we get the data closer to the computation, uh, we also try to overlap the memory access and computation as much as possible. Um, and, uh, and, and that's what we discussed so far. And now, I want you to take all of this with a grain of salt, because by the end of this lecture, we will be discussing architectures that are not von Neumann and do not adhere to this computing model. But, uh, but this is still the, um, the dominant way of doing computing nowadays. Um, we also looked at important uh, neural network primitives. Uh, specifically, we wanted to take this computational view of neural network primitives. So we discussed the memory versus computation requirement of important components like, you know, convolutions, uh, fully connected layers or linear layers. We also briefly kind of uh, went over attention mechanisms um, and more compound blocks like bottleneck blocks, inverted bottleneck blocks. Uh, and uh, recurrent neural networks like LSTMs. And the previous lecture wasn't meant to really be a comprehensive uh, list of all of the uh, neural network primitives, but just to uh, change our perspective on how we look at these primitives. So now if, you, if someone comes up with a new primitive, you will go in and say, okay, this is how big the parameters are. This is uh, the number of computations I need to do to complete this thing. I know that it's memory bound or it's compute bound. Uh, so you should be able to comment on these layers uh, in this way, um, at least so far. Uh, 
So, um, so today um, we will kind of think about how to redesign a computer chip to work for, uh, for machine learning or for deep neural networks specifically. And we will start by kind of uh, going over the analysis and metrics used to evaluate chips. So if I have a GPU and a CPU and an FPGA in front of me, how do I know which one is the best one? Uh, so that's kind of the first section, all about hardware analysis. The second part will be about hardware efficiency. So we will talk a bit about how we optimize hardware specifically for deep learning workloads. So we'll go over some arithmetic memory uh, and sparsity concepts. And finally, we'll go over a bunch of case studies uh, of chips that people are, are building today, have built or uh, currently building in startups um, for machine learning. So yeah, before diving in, um, I pasted this uh, intro kind of that I had in one of my talks uh, about uh, the idea of uh, how software is driving hardware and how um, machine learning is kind of the new software. Um, so yeah, so I mean, a long time ago, uh, people used to actually write code uh, to kind of solve real world problems, things like image classification. So people sat down and they uh, manually wrote kind of rules and, and manually crafted features to figure out um, what's in an image. So if, if they see this image, they'll say, oh, pointy ears, I need to put that in my program. Because if I see pointy ears, then that means it might be a cat. And if you have enough features that match, then you will kind of say, okay, this image contains a cat in the end. Uh, of course, this didn't work really well. And so uh, turns out that for real problems, it's much easier to gather data than it is to write code. And uh, some people call, so, so this is obviously deep learning, deep neural networks, uh, and some people call it software 2.0. At first I was like, oh, what is this? Like, oh, why do they keep adding numbers and, 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 and kind of inventing these uh, technical terms? But, but I actually like this term because it, it is a new way of thinking about software. Uh, you no longer have to write the algorithm itself, but um, you write kind of this, um, obviously this neural network that learns the algorithm for you. So it's a new paradigm of doing software. And uh, my argument is that, you know, if, if you have a new paradigm of doing software, a new way of writing software, then you definitely need a new underlying hardware to support that as well, right? And so um, when we look at uh, deep neural networks and compare them to traditional programs, we will see that they're very different in nature, right? So deep neural networks are massively parallel. They have somewhat of a uniform building block, ma mainly these dot products and nonlinear functions. Um, and then the defining feature is that they only work when they have a very large compute and memory um, footprint. And so, um, as we kind of um, went over in the first lecture, it took 30 years between kind of figuring out back propagation and then trying it out on a CPU for 30 years and it still didn't work. Um, then only when people tried it out on a GPU, which was the right hardware substrate for it, um, did it actually work. And what I'm highlighting here is that just kind of the amount of uh, the number of operations we can do in parallel on a CPU versus a GPU um, which really enables, uh, enabled all of this. So, so in this lecture, we want to figure out, you know, what to do with chip area. So this is kind of a, a floor plan or, or a, actually it's a, it's a die photo of, um, of an Intel CPU. And we see this has six cores. It has kind of uh, a huge cache and a bunch of other things. And if we zoom in in one of these cores, we will see that you know we have this orange block here, and that's uh, FPU, floating point unit. SIMD means uh, single instruction multiple data. So basically, this is where the math happens. Um, so in the case of neural networks, this is where the dot products will be executed. But if we go back to the original die photo and, and kind of project this on it, this is how big, uh, how big a part of the chip. Uh, this is the size of the chip that's dedicated for these Todd products. So that's all I have in my neural network. That's all I want to accelerate. Of course, this is kind of stamped out in each core. But um, 
the sheer scale of the chip compared to the part dedicated for my main computational unit is very small. And so uh, what, what is the rest of it uh, doing? So here we have kind of this um, instruction cache, right? Uh, instruction caches are very useful for things that have complex control flow, lots of if statements and lots of branches. Uh, we have the store buffer, load store area. So just some logic to figure out how to do loads and stores. Um, this is the data cache. Uh, obviously, data caching is important also for deep learning, but here it's actually quite a small part of the chip. Uh, decode and microcode ROM. I actually don't know what that is. Um, branch prediction. Again, another part dedicated for figuring out this control flow, which I have very little of in neural networks. So, base, so instead of uh, de um, dedicating all that area for... Um, for all of this complex control flow mechanisms, what can I do with that chip area, right? So uh, James is asking a question. Um, the system arc for CPU, what's the incentive of using a large L3 as a victim cache? Looks like the L3 is not going to RAM. And I believe Intel CPU uses their L3 as a victim cache as well. I actually don't know what you mean, James, by victim cache. Uh, maybe if you, if you want to unmute and, and chat about it. Um, but basically, adding levels of caching um, usually improves uh, program speed on CPUs. So uh, this would be kind of a shared cache between all cores. Um, so yeah, I'm not sure what the victim cache is. So maybe we can take it offline if you don't want to unmute. Um, um, yeah, so... Um, so yes, yeah, so what, what can we do with this chip area to build efficient hardware for deep learning, right? And uh, one final note is that, you know, I, I told you it took 30 years to get to AlexNet and it took GPUs to enable AlexNet, right? Uh, but AlexNet is now 10 years old and it's actually quite small compared to the workload that we're looking at today. So if we compare AlexNet uh, in size to something like GPT-3, which is uh, which I think is still the state-of-the-art language model, um, there are many, many orders of magnitude difference in the size of the model, the number of computations uh, it takes to train the model. For example, GPT-3 requires the equivalent of 355 GPU years to train. So if you take one GPU, you need 350 years to train that model. Obviously they take hundreds of GPUs to train it uh, and that makes it a bit more tractable, um, but it's a huge model and that's the trend uh, moving forward. Models are getting bigger, data is getting bigger as well. There's also a question of sustainability, like the carbon footprint of just training this one model is equivalent to 176 houses so the electricity bill of 176 houses for a whole year, or taking a car and driving it from here to the moon, I think, 700,000 kilometers. Um, and so, so it's, and it costs a lot of money too, right? Like it costs about $5 million uh, just for training this, like for renting the GPUs and for um, paying the electricity bill. So it's definitely not sustainable. Uh, and GPUs are definitely not the end all answer anymore, because uh, these numbers are all based on GPUs, right? And so we need to really figure out how to get more efficiency out of the hardware. And so when I say hardware, what do I mean? So there are many kinds of hardware <clears throat> out there, but these are the four most used ones uh, or the four most popular ones. Um, and so we have these general purpose programmable or software programmable hardware. So we have CPUs, which, which we all know, and GPUs as well. So I can write code, it gets compiled to these, um, these hardware targets, right? And then we have specialized hardware. That's when I construct my own uh, data flow or I construct my own hardware dedicated for a specific application. Uh, and sometimes that hardware that is specialized is still somewhat programmable and you need some programmability there, but it's not, it's usually not Turing complete. It cannot execute any program. It, it is specialized for a very specific um, class of applications or a very specific single application even, right? And that's the case with ASICs. So application specific integrated circuit. 
And ASIC just means a dedicated chip, right? And then FPGAs. Uh, and FPGAs are these uh, chips where you can program any hardware onto them. So they are like ASICs, but they are programmable. So it's the same chip. I can download a circuit doing an addition operation on it. And then I can download another circuit that does multiplication. I can download another circuit that does compression or encryption or, or, or implements a deep neural network or, or anything else, right? And so, um, so FPGAs, you can think of them as programmable, but programmable hardware circuits uh, or programmable ha digital hardware circuits. So um, another thing is that we, um, it's, it's no longer sufficient to kind of, uh, as we touched upon before, um, to use one kind of chip everywhere. So, so previously you would see CPUs in data centers, you would see CPUs in mobile phones, small ARM cores, uh, you would see uh, lots of CPUs in cars. Uh, I actually, I, I chatted with people at Daimler at one point and they told me that they have, I think, 76 computers or small cores um, in their car. And I mean, one, a couple of them are used for the entertainment system. Some of them are used for the automatic braking. Some of them are used for redundancy, just to make sure if one of them fails, the other one it, it works. Some of them are used for kind of the, electro the electric windows, just to get the windows up and down and not have them break uh, uh, and things like that. So there are so many CPUs in cars as well. But now, uh, as deep learning is kind of perforating all of these systems, we actually need a special chip in each one of those um, um, places, right? And so in data centers today, uh, we see Google, they're creating their own uh, tensor processing unit for accelerating deep learning. Um, companies like Microsoft are integrating FPGAs in every data center node they have around the world. So this is actually quite a big thing. Um, Facebook just announced they're building I think I want like a huge GPU cluster for deep learning research. And many companies have GPUs obviously in their um, data centers. On mobile phones, we have these systems on chip that are low power and part of the chip, a big part of the chip is dedicated just for neur neural processing units. And it's used a lot for the camera functions and, uh, and video uh, editing, speech recognition and things like that. So it's a dedicated chip for deep learning on the mobile phones. And then with cars, we see uh, Tesla uh, implementing their own full self-driving chip. NVIDIA have a dedicated uh, kind of product as well for auto uh, called Xavier. Um, and, and the trend goes on. There are many other companies like Mobileye and other companies as well, uh, building dedicated chips for um, self-driving cars or for the computer vision part of self-driving cars. Okay, so, um, so, so that's, you know, um, that's why you should be interested and why you should be excited. And, and, and you should really kind of um, by now be convinced that there is no other way around it. Um, like even if, uh, you know, our class size is 35 people right now, we, we need 10 times that class size to basically get enough ideas to solve this problem. We have, um, deep neural networks, which are working really well, but to train one of these models, we're using um, you know, electricity equivalent to 200 houses, right? So it's, it's not sustainable, it's not working. And the only way around it is by rethinking, not just the algorithm and how we train that neural network or the software even, but also completely rethinking the hardware underneath as well. And so by the end of this lecture, you should know a bit about how to go uh, and design a piece of um, hardware that's much more efficient for deep learning. So the first learning objective is to kind of be able to calculate important metrics for machine learning hardware. So we'll start by just very simple performance metrics and go on to more complex things like roof lines, uh, another kind of analysis uh, um, plots. And then a uh, second learning objective is to know how to optimize that hardware. Okay, so now that I have uh, a very simple machine doing uh, uh, accelerating a deep neural network, how do I make it even faster? And where are the opportunities for research uh, in, uh, in figuring out how to improve it? 
Uh, and finally, we want to be able to an easily analyze emerging machine learning hardware architectures. Uh, so if, if, you know, if a new startup comes out and says, I'm doing it this way, you should be able to say, ah, okay, but this is the advantage of doing it this way, but you're missing out on that other thing, which uh, you're not really leveraging in your architecture. So you should be able to comment on different um, deep learning chips, whether it's existing chips or whether it's emerging uh, startups. <clears throat> Okay, I'll pause for 30 seconds um, if people have any questions, and then we'll go into the first section. Okay. All right, okay, so... Um, so we're starting with these performance metrics. And uh, what we want to figure out here is um, how fast is this chip for a deep learning workload? Um, and I've been, I've been saying flops and flops per second uh, in the past couple of lectures already. Uh, but here we really kind of need to understand what that means. Uh, so flops stand for uh, floating point operations per second, right? So that is what is the number of operation, floating point specifically operations per second that uh, I can perform on this piece of hardware. And the reason it's floating point is that, uh, as you may know, deep neural networks started with floating point operations. Uh, now you will often see just ops without the FL. So we'll just see ops per second. Uh, especially when evaluating chips for inference where uh, reduced precision is, is often used. So if, if you see a GPU and it says, we're running this neural network in eight bits, eight bits is not a floating point format anymore. So it's, uh, so it's just an up per second, it's an integer up per second. Um, so you will often also see max per second and max stands for multiply accumulate. Because uh, our primitive operation is this dot product, uh, max uh, is, is often used because, um, you, you know, it's always multiply and accumulate in a dot product. Uh, that is the smallest uh, unit uh, of computation. And so uh, max per second is usually just half the flops per second. So if you kind of open the web page for an NVIDIA chip and it says, you know, 100 teramax per second, uh, you know that that's 200 teraflops per second or teraops per second, basically. Um, yeah, we already covered that, you know, if it's not floating point, it's just called ops per second. And uh, a very important concept here is that chips are actually often labeled with peak flops per second or peak teraops per second or peak ops per second. So what does that mean? That means they just took the number of multipliers and adders they have on the chip and they multiplied it by the frequency of operation, and they gave you um, they gave you a number. They said, if my chip is fully utilized, 100% all of the time, uh, this is how fast it could run. This is the number of operations per second it could perform. Um, and you should always take that number with a grain of salt because um, you never actually hit that number, except in very few cases. So for real workloads, utilization is never 100%. And so, um, so I pasted this equation here for computing the number of operations per second. So it's equal to kind of the clock cycle or the speed of operation uh, times um, the number of PEs and times the number of cycles for each operation. So, um, so what is a cycle? A cycle means a clock cycle or the smallest unit of execution on uh, a computer. And so, um, so cycles per second is, how, is kind of my clock speed. So if my speed is one gigahertz, this is how many cycles I can go through in one second. And then how many cycles does it actually take me to perform this operation? So if multiplication takes four cycles, then I would put you know, a four here. Uh, cycles per second is one gigahertz and then number of PEs. And when I say PE, PE means a processing element. And often now, uh, in the age of kind of parallel architectures, you would have so many of those PEs on your chip. So, um, so a PE, 
uh, it's not quite a core, but it's uh, so obviously on CPUs, you have multiple cores on GPUs, you have many CUDA cores. Um, and it's basically it corresponds more to a CUDA core in a GPU. But you can think of it for the purposes of this equation as the number of multipliers that you have, how many multiplications can you do in parallel, that is the number of PEs that you have. Okay, so that's kind of the uh, compute performance. Uh, but like we said, for all, uh, for all of our computers, we have this compute part of the chip and we have a memory part of the chip. And so um, what are the different metrics related to memory? Um, so um, the first one is obviously memory capacity. And we briefly touched upon that before as well when we said, you know, what, what does it mean for a model not to fit on a GPU? Uh, well, that means that I can't fit, you know, my training data, my activations, and my parameters on the external memory attached to that GPU. So there is no way of executing it on a single GPU. And so that's kind of the capacity of the chip connected to my accelerator. And usually memory is quite plentiful. So like I said, for, um, for desktop computers, even now you have, I don't know, 256 gigabyte memory. And so it's quite big. But for high performance memory, for very fast memory, um, it's usually uh, quite a bit smaller. So modern GPUs often have on the order of um, tens of gigabytes, usually capped around 32 gigabytes of memory. And then the more important metric perhaps is the memory bandwidth. So that's how fast can I get stuff from external memory onto my chip? And so that's measured in you know, bytes per second or typically gigabytes per second. And I'm showing an example here for, I think this is for DDR4 or something, where it's 20 gigabytes per second. Uh, on GPUs, this number is much higher, maybe 200 gigabytes per second. And that's why their memories are much smaller. Um, and, uh, and, and these are not the only metrics related to memory, of course, because while these are specific to external memory, we often have, uh, like I said, a memory hierarchy. And so uh, I'm showing, you know, just the external memory in this simplified view. But as you know, we also have an on-chip memory, uh, things like caches, scratch pads, on-chip buffers, RAMs, uh, and also registers as well. So th the main analysis tool uh, when putting both compute and memory together is what's called a roofline plot. Um, and um, and roofline plots have been around for a long time, but they haven't been that useful um, for many non-compute heavy tasks. So, uh, so they're, they're more useful when you're kind of pushing your chip to the edge and really running um, a very high performance application on it, which deep learning is. So now they're becoming much more relevant when comparing chips to each other or when designing a new chip. And so what is this roofline plot? Um, what is it? What, what, what is it showing us here? So on the x-axis, I have this operational intensity. Um, and that's a property of my application. That's not a property of my hardware. So the thing I'm running on that hardware, the neural network, what is the number of operations per byte of that neural network? So we went through kind of the convolution in the last lecture and we kept counting the number of operations. We counted the memory footprint and this operational intensity is basically dividing this number of operations by the number of, um, by, the, by the memory footprint, right? What is the operations for each byte of data that I need to load from memory? When I bring in one of those filters or one of those parameters from off chip, to the compute chip, how many operations do I perform on it, basically, right? So it's a ratio of memory, of compute to memory for, um, for a compute primitive. And then on the y-axis, I have performance uh, on a specific hardware chip. So what is the achieved operations per second uh, on this chip? And usually, you know, when you have a very small operational intensity, so somewhere around here. So that means you need to fetch like, you know, a gigabyte of data from off chip and you do one operation on it and then you throw it back out. So this is definitely compute bound. So no matter what I do, I can't kind of increase my performance beyond this, um, this slanted line because I'm memory bound. 
So this is the maximum performance I can get um, when, uh, when memory is the main bottleneck, right? And then as you increase the operational intensity, you, uh, so here, for example, you're fetching one megabyte from off chip and doing 10 operations on it. And so at this point, the, uh, your limiting factor starts becoming the peak performance of the chip. That number I said that we almost never achieve. Um, and so, so here, where I'm, I'm just loading a very small thing from off chip, and I'm, um, I'm doing many operations on it, then the operations become the bottleneck, not the loading from memory. Um, so, so yeah, so, so basically in this part of the roof line, we're bandwidth limited, we're memory bandwidth limited. And in this part of the roof line, we are compute limited. And so let's take a look at an example workload. So let's say I have a neural network. I took the number of operations. I divided it by the size of the parameters and intermediate activations and all of the memory footprint. And I found that you know it fell here on the operational intensity kind of line. And so I would, um, I would kind of draw a vertical line and see where I hit the roof line. And usually, if it hits in that mem if it hits the slanted part of the of the roof line, then that means it's memory bound. And I should mention the the slope here is equivalent to the memory bandwidth, while the line here is equivalent to the peak performance. Uh, so uh, so this is basically the twenty gigabytes per second that I mentioned before. Uh, so. So I, I mean, and I'm drawing here this, uh, again, this very simple model of hardware that we have. So we have an accelerator, it's connected to external memory, and my example workload is memory bound. So what do I do at this point uh, if I want to speed up this application? Um, so anyone wants to guess? So. Or does anyone have questions about the roof line so far? So this is one of the important concepts that we want to cover in this lecture. So make sure you understand it. Uh, okay, I'll just continue. <laughs> so, um, okay, someone wrote something. Get better memory, make the workload less memory intensive. Yes. That's exactly what we should do, Aman, mentioned, Aman answered. Faster memory from when he, yes, that's also correct. So good, people are, are still with me, that's good. <laughs> so, um, so I already verbally kind of mentioned what ops per byte is, uh, but here it is for completeness. Uh, again, it's the kind of the total number of operations that I need to perform divided by the total memory footprint. Um, and it's important to kind of know that the memory footprint is not just the parameters, but also the activations and intermediate results that are coming out of the neural network. Ah, so I have, I have a question as well. So maybe everyone can now answer. <laughs> How um, can you speed up a memory bound application? I can't wait until you guys get here next week. It's yeah, teaching an empty class is uh, is weird. So. Me too. Yes, I'm sure. I'm sure you also don't like sitting in front of a screen. So, <laughs> okay. So I think most people answered, and uh, so fourteen people said use a larger memory chip. So. Okay, so a memory bound application is one where I cannot load in memory fast enough from external memory. And what that means is that loading memory is the slow part of my application. It's quite slow to get memory from off chip to on chip. It's not really speaking to the capacity of the external memory chip. Uh, 
um, because things fit on the external memory chip. They're fine. But I just can't get them on the compute chip fast enough, right? So it's not, so that's not the answer. Um, use a faster memory chip. Of course, that's correct. So to, to, to speed up loading of memory from external memory to on-chip, um, I need a faster memory chip. So that will get things on my chip faster. Uh, and so, uh, like I think um, Aman said, uh, we can just replace our DDR3 with GDDR3 or DDR4 or something else. So using a faster memory chip with faster external memory bandwidth. So instead of 20 gigabytes per second, it would be 40 gigabytes per second or 100 gigabytes per second. So actually most people g uh, gave that answer, 21 people. Um, and then answer number three is add more multipliers. So of course, if I, if I need to load one or 10 gigabytes of data from external memory and do one operation on it, so that's the example I gave, right? So you, we need to load so much things from external memory and do one operation on it. Adding 100 more multipliers won't help because, um, I mean, it will only speed up this compute part of my problem. It will not speed up the bottleneck, which is loading of memory. And so four people gave that answer. Um, and then finally, use lower numerical precision. So, so this is an interesting one. So this is an example of an algorithmic change or a workload change that can improve uh, my operational intensity. So it's no longer um, making my, um, it, it's no longer speeding up the roof line itself. It's no longer changing the roof line but it's changing where that application sits on the x-axis. So that means it can move from being memory bound to compute bound. So remember compute intensity or operational intensity is the number of operations. So how many operations divided by the memory footprint in terms of bytes. So if I use a lower numerical precision, I still actually need to do the same number of operations. Operations are different, but I still need to do the same number. But every time, I load a fewer number of bytes because if my um, if my previous precision was 32 bits, I need to load four bytes for each operation. But if I go to eight bits, I need to load one byte for each operation. So I'm actually moving it along the x-axis here. So Mayura is saying, how do you make the memory chip faster? Uh, and that's a very good question. Uh, you replace it. So you find a different memory chip that is faster and you connect it to your hardware. And obviously it has to be compatible with your hardware as well. Um, so I think that's what we'll do here. Um, so yeah, so, th so this is what I was pointing out with you know, reducing precision. So when you reduce precision, you are executing the same number of operations, but just the number of bytes are much smaller that you need to load from memory. And so operational intensity, you're just reducing the uh, thing in the bottom of that fraction, you're reducing the number you're dividing by. So you're increasing the operational intensity. And if you're memory bound, that just means that corresponds to an increase in, um, in performance, right? Or you can even move it all the way to be performance bound or compute bound here. So uh, the other way of doing it is using a faster memory chip as many people responded as well. So my previous chip was that fast. So remember the slope is equal to your external memory bandwidth. Uh, and if you work out kind of the units here, it will, it, will, uh, it will check out. So operations per second divided by operations per byte, the operations cancel, bytes are on top. So it's bytes per second, it's my memory bandwidth um, basically. So when you have a faster thing, it's a bigger number and a more steep slope, which means um, it would kind of change my application from previously being uh, memory bound to potentially being compute bound because my roof line has moved so much. So uh, here I replaced external memory with a faster one, in this case DDR4, which isn't actually much faster, but it's just an example. Um, yeah, so I mean, uh, there's a question. How does DDR4 handle increased cycles per second compared to DDR3? So, so DDR4 can, um, can, load, um, can load stuff from external memory faster. So cycles per second. Uh, 
So cycles per second is kind of the frequency at which your chip runs. So I'm, I'm actually not sure uh, how, did you, how the DDR4 spec is faster. It could be the frequency of operation. So it could be just it has a faster clock and gets stuff on chip faster that way. Or it could have a wider bus as well um, or more memory banks or something so that it can load more memory faster, uh, more memory in the same clock period. So uh, in terms of cycles per second, um, which is your frequency, it's, uh, DDR4 is potentially faster because of a higher frequency, but I'm actually just not sure of the spec. Um, yeah, I hope that answered your question three. Okay, so um, it does. Okay, so, um, so as I said, in, in this example here, our example workload is now compute bound. And so how do you, how do you fix a compute bound application? And so now we're not looking at the memory chip anymore, uh, but if I want to increase the performance of this application, then uh, my, my only option is to kind of uh, go in and speed up my accelerator somehow. So in this case, I, I just give, I'm giving the example of overclocking your accelerator, which people often do with uh, GPUs or CPUs. Um, so you just make your accelerator faster. Uh, in this case, uh, three, it would be also kind of faster cycles per second on the accelerator itself. So it can consume all of that data more quickly and do the operations more quickly. And so I'm no longer um, compute bound. Uh, and if you hit that elusive kind of corner of the roof line, then you're kind of, you have a perfectly matched application or workload to this hardware. That means uh, that this memory speed and this compute capacity exactly matches the operational intensity of my um, application or my workload. And so now it's perfect. So of course, I also mentioned uh, before that, you know, um, we never actually hit the roof line. Uh, the roof line is still the theoretical limit of how fast I can run this application on this chip if hardware utilization is 100%. So if I'm always using all of the multipliers, there is no waste at all. There is no control overhead. Um, there is no latency associated with bringing stuff on chip and I can hide all of that latency by overlapping compute and memory. And so, so everything is perfect in, our, in this scenario of, you know, we're actually hitting the roof line and achieving that performance. So usually what it will look like is more like this, you know, I compute the operational intensity of AlexNet and then I measure how fast it runs on the chip. And it's usually below the, uh, it will usually be quite a bit below the roof line, especially on things like CPUs and, and maybe even GPUs, because it's a general purpose chip. It has overheads associated with caching, with uh, branch prediction, like I said, with, uh, um, with just the compute not fitting my chip. I gave the example last time of, you know, my number of channels is not a multiple of 64, but my number of uh, compute elements on the chip are a multiple of 64. So I'm often not using all of 64 multipliers. And so in this case, you get some wastage and so on. So the achieved performance doesn't hit the roof line because of memory access efficiency. So uh, another thing about external memory is that if you're loading from random addresses, you often get, uh, you, you get nowhere near your peak memory bandwidth. So uh, the, in the example before I said, oh, memory bandwidth of 20 gigabytes per second. I've never actually measured 20 gigabytes per second on a chip. Uh, I think at Intel, when we measured, uh, we had some micro benchmarks to measure the efficiency of external memory accesses for different deep learning workloads. And in, in that case, the highest we ever got was 79%. And this was a really good number and we celebrated when we, when we saw that number. But usually memory access efficiency is close to 60 or 70% just because uh, the, you can only ever hit 100% uh, if you are always loading from successive memory addresses. So your memory address is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, 10, 11, all the way to kind of the end of the memory. If you ever change that, if you go from one to 10, and then back to three and then to four. So these 
cannot be coalesced anymore. They cannot be grouped into uh, a cache line, for example, and fetched from off chip together. Because the way external memory works is actually when you're loading a byte of data, it fetches way more than that. It fetches, I don't know, one megabyte of data or something like that, uh, all at once. And what, what that means is that it coalesces all of your reads uh, in the memory controller. So there is a component called a memory controller. It takes memory read requests. It coalesces them. So it says, OK, I have these five requests. Can I now send a request to external memory to bring all of those five pieces of data or not? And if they're not in successive memory addresses, it will not be able to do it efficiently. All that's to say, um, memory access efficiency really limits your peak um, your peak performance, especially when you're memory bound, right? Uh, we also mentioned compute utilization. So again, if I'm not using every single multiplier on the chip, I'll never hit that roof line in terms of peak uh, compute performance. And finally, control flow. So if I have any data hazards or control hazards, which again is not present all that much in neural networks, but if I have any of those, then I need to wait and um, until, um, until I can continue execution. And so in that case, any, any complexity in the neural network topology or lack of parallelism would, uh, would kind of stall as well and make me kind of below that roof line. And so in assignment one, you will go off and plot many of these roof lines. You will benchmark many of these applications and hopefully you, you will really get a feel for um, the performance of different neural networks on different hardware targets as well. So I'm excited about releasing A1 um, next Monday, I think. And here I'm showing you kind of a real roof line. So that previous one, I have this disclaimer here that everything is just randomly plotted. But this is a real roof line from um, the TPU paper, which is the assigned reading of this week. And so you see here, um, a, it's, it's a log-log scale, so the differences are actually bigger than it may seem. And uh, let's look at one of those workloads. So here, what they're doing in this paper is that they're plotting uh, different important workloads to Google on this roof line to see how much better they can be compared to a GPU and a CPU. And then they have their TPU here. So all of the stars correspond to the TPU. I mean, the first thing you'll notice is that all of the stars are actually above the roof lines for the GPU and the CPU. So, uh, so the authors of this paper are claiming, okay, we can do way better than these two existing devices by just going to our specialized ASIC called the TPU, right? Um, the other thing is that, you know, this, for this single application uh, called MLP0 here, the operational intensity is actually different for each device. Um, which, is, which I thought was interesting, right? Because an application should have the same operational intensity that's, um, that's independent of the chip. Um, can, can you think of why um, this same um, application or the same workload, this MLP0, has different operational intensities? Um, so let me relaunch that poll. Um, Oops. Hmm. I did, I did this before, right? Yeah, I got it. Yes. Relaunch. Okay. So how can the same neural network have different, have a different operational intensity on different hardware? Um, so what do you think? So put your answer in the poll thingy, if you can see it. Okay. Oh, it started off well, but I think now answers are all over the place. Uh, so. So yeah, we have 87% of the answer right now. 
Um, and um, so maybe we'll stop here. So, so different supported numerical precision. So that's that's the main one, right? Um, um, basically, having uh, as we said before, uh, one of the things that can change your operational intensity is to have different supported precisions. And in this case, the TPU was running uh, that MLP workload uh, at int eight precision, uh, and it didn't actually support other precisions for it. Whereas the GPU was running it at FP32 precision and the same for the CPU. And so it isn't really quite a fair comparison. I mean, the plot looks good, but, uh, but it's important to kind of also focus on those um, details when looking at a plot like this, right? Like what, what are my operations and what is the size of my weight or uh, my size of my parameters uh, and all of these things. Uh, it, other things could affect um, your operational intensity, um, include kind of whether you have compression coming from an off-chip uh, off chip memory. So sometimes there's integrated kind of compression. And I think NVIDIA published a paper about this where they are trying to um, implement um, a compression engine to compress everything coming from external memory and therefore, or going out to external memory as well, and therefore uh, make better use of that external memory bandwidth. So, so basically it has to be something that affects my workload to change my operational intensity. Um, oh, sure, yes. So we can, we can talk about the rest of these as well. So, uh, so remember the operational intensity uh, is a property of my workload and it's the number, ah, uh, this works. It's the number of operations divided by memory footprint, right? Footprint. So if, if, that's, uh, if that's the equation, then I need to e either change the um, numerator or denominator to change this number. And if we look at number two, uh, or choice number two here, where it says different memory bandwidth on each device. So this is a property of the device and not the workload. Um, and it would not change this equation, right? It would only change um, the um, kind of the, uh, the, the slope of my roof line in the memory bound part. So the, uh, on the X axis, the, the workload would still be in the same place. And then number three is different number of PEs on each device. So again, that's a property of the um, memory of the compute chip. It's not a property of the workload. So it will not affect this equation. Again, uh, which is just, I take the model and I compute the number of operations I need to perform um, divided by the number, the memory footprint. And so in, in the case number three, this would raise kind of my compute bound part of my roof line. So it would, uh, it would increase, um, it, would, it would raise this part or the, the kind of flat part of the roof line because it increases the peak performance. And finally, different on-chip memory hierarchy uh, again, that could see, speed up my achieved performance, uh, right? Because I'm caching things on chip uh, and I'm getting stuff done faster this way. But again, it doesn't affect my workload. And that's why it's, um, it's fairly important to kind of distinguish between those metrics. What actually uh, um, is affected by my hardware? What is affected by my neural network? And what is affected by both? And you will see here that the operational intensity, which is again, the X axis um, is only a property of the neural network. So I need to change my, my, work, my workload itself to be able to uh, change my operational intensity. Um, in terms of hardware metrics, my peak performance and my memory bandwidth, these have nothing to do with the neural network, right? So these are properties of the hardware itself. How fast can my compute elements run? How fast uh, is that connection and that memory controller uh, between my uh, compute chip and my memory chip? Whereas you will see a bunch of other metrics um, that are uh, a property of both the uh, hardware and the neural network. So hardware utilization, like I said, it depends on the number of multipliers you have on chip and the number of multiplications you need to do. So that will uh, 
come from both your neural network and your hardware. Uh, the throughput, uh, of course, it depends on your hardware because it's highly correlated to your peak performance, but it also depends on um, kind of how friendly the um, you know, read accesses are to external memory. What are the, um, can I coalesce all my reads? What is my hardware efficiency and so on? So the achieved throughput while it's correlated to, you know, your hardware capabilities, it also depends on your workload, whether your workload is friendly and works well on that hardware or not. And finally, latency. Uh, so throughput is the number of operations per second, so it's achieved performance. Uh, and then latency is how fast I can complete my, um, um, my the execution. So from start to finish, how many seconds does that take? And again, that depends on both the hardware uh, and the neural network. And so another question from Sri. Uh, so the throughput uh, does depend on DNN, but would we relate it to it when comparing performance of the same DNN over multiple hardware? Um, yes, so ultimately what you care about is those bottom two here. So how, uh, so throughput is how fast, well, Let's start with latency, actually. So uh, latency is how fast I can perform one inference. So if this is, you know, uh, time here, um, and I'm performing, uh, in the case of inference, let's simplify it. Let's not talk about training at the moment. But uh, for latency is how fast I can do this. So I'm getting a request coming in. Someone is talking in his phone. He's saying, hey, Google, what's the weather? I need to do kind of respond as fast as possible. And so I got that request in the data center. Uh, it goes onto my TPU, for example, if I'm Google, and then a response comes back out after, you know, in this case, 0 0.25 seconds. And Google are, are usually very proud of this number. You know, you see a Google search still tells you, uh, this search was done in 0.1 seconds or something at the top of the page. So that's latency. That's from the request coming in, to the response going out. Uh, while the throughput here, is how many of those requests I can process in per second or in every second. And here I can perform four inferences per second. So that's my throughput. And so to come back to your question three, so what I ultimately care about is this latency and this throughput. So these are the only metrics from the stuff I talked about in the last slide that actually affects my application and affect my, in this case, end user experience uh, for kind of, Google search or um, or voice search or whatever it is, right? And so, uh, so when comparing between chips, this is the number that we care about. Uh, but obviously when we're designing a chip, we want to figure out all of these other numbers because um, these are kind of the constituents that go into producing that final latency or throughput number. So hardware efficiency, I need to, when designing the chip, I need to make sure that my hardware efficiency is really high. I need to have a high peak um, peak throughput because otherwise I have no chance of kind of increasing my performance. I will always have the ceiling if I have a low peak throughput uh, and so on. So uh, I hope that kind of covered what, what you were asking, but feel free to ask again. Um, okay. So um, by the way, I'm happy in this lecture where I'm actually getting a bit more questions. So please don't be shy, you should stop me. Uh, and ask questions uh, if, you, if anything is unclear. I mean, that's the whole purpose of the lecture, right? Um, and so, um, so someone may say, you know, isn't uh, throughput always one divided by latency, right? And the answer is no, uh, because we have something called batching and it's really important uh, for our kind of applications as well. And that's when we can run multiple inferences in parallel, for example, in the case of inference. So uh, I'm getting two requests, I'm getting two people, uh, asking for the weather, I'm batching those two requests. Um, I'm sticking them both in my GPU. And um, and in this case, for example, latency is actually um, a bit longer. It's, it's actually a bit higher than my previous latency, but my throughput is also higher. So, uh, so throughput equal one over latency, that's only true for batch size equals one. Uh, but if I have batching, throughput and latency are no longer um, related to each other in a direct way. Uh, batch size has a big role to play as well. Okay, so um, so we just kind of covered the first part of the lecture here. Uh, 
um, and this is way slower than I actually thought this would be. Um, but but perhaps it's uh, it's good to stop here and again ask for any questions so far. So uh, what we covered so far is you know uh, straightforward concepts of how do we evaluate um, a, a compute chip or or how do how do we evaluate an accelerator for deep neural networks, right? We, we really need to take memory and compute into account. We have flops per second in terms of compute and uh, gigabytes per second or bytes per second in terms of memory. Um, but in isolation, they don't mean much because we really need to also look at the application and the operational intensity of the application and how it matches to uh, my memory bandwidth and peak throughput. And then once we plot that, uh, once we put those two things together, we have this roofline plot, which is a very useful analysis tool um, in both comparing and uh, analyzing uh, DNN accelerators or accelerators in general. Um, and then finally, we, uh, we talked about how, um, how achieved throughput is never kind of the same as um, peak throughput and how uh, utilization and, uh, and other factors come into play as well. And also uh, how we can change the application itself to have a better operational intensity that fits uh, a certain application. And so if, if there are no uh, more questions, perhaps we can dive into maybe the first part of hardware efficiency. Um, but then, yeah, we, we, can, we can also go over it again next time. So I think we have just 10 minutes left. Um, so, so yeah, so hard, how do we get efficiency out of the hardware? Uh, and so here we will talk more about uh, how do we, again, go from CPU to accelerator. Uh, and, and this um, image here is quite striking because what it shows is the energy breakdown of a single addition instruction uh, on a CPU. So I have two numbers, five and seven. I want to add them together to get 12. Five plus seven equals 12. And so to do this on a computer, um, where am I spending the energy? And it's quite striking because the addition operation itself, the adder, takes this much energy, this red slither at the end of that uh, bar here. And the rest of it is used for other stuff. Um, and again, it, it correlates to that chip area that I showed before. Most of it is used in caching, register file accesses, uh, control, branch prediction, all of that stuff. And so how do we, um, so is that good enough? No, it's not. There's a lot of inefficiency. If I want to do an add, I should do just add uh, in the ideal world. And so how do I make my hardware more efficient or how do I gain more efficiency compared to that previous thing I showed. So there are many ways of doing that. And one of them is changing the arithmetic. So we can use specialized instructions um, to amortize overhead, right? Uh, so we'll go over that. We can use lower precision. Of course, we already touched upon that a bit. Uh, we can optimize our memory for memory bound applications. This really affects things. And, we, uh, and there we really want to leverage reuse of data and make sure data locality is achieved. So we'll talk about these concepts. So locality means the data is always close to my compute when, when it needs to be computed. Um, ineffectual operations. And that means if, if, if an operation is a no-op, if I'm multiplying by zero, I would like to skip that. Uh, and so that's one of the current open problems in uh, deep learning hardware. How can I uh, effectively skip ineffectual operations? Then other techniques include kind of model optimizations. So changing uh, the workload itself in a fundamental way uh, to be able to uh, better fit the hardware to either reduce the flops. So like going from you know, VGG to uh, efficient net or something or by changing the model topology to better fit my hardware. So these are model optimization techniques that we'll also cover in this class but not in this uh, specific lecture. So we'll talk about it in the next module. So um, the first technique that I had there was related to arithmetic and it was called amortize overhead. Um, and so the idea is that I have this, these blue bars, which are my overhead. 
Um, and I'm only doing a very small operation in the end. Uh, and so I need to kind of repeat this overhead every time I do another addition. So every time I do an add, I spend all of this, you know, 25 picojoules on an instruction cache access. I need a new instruction. Uh, I have register file access. I have some control. And then I do that addition. And then I have another add request, like add instruction coming in. And I need to do all of that again. But a kind of standard way of improving that is to actually increase what I'm doing with all of this overhead. So increase the computation uh, with the same overhead. So for a single instruction, instead of doing a single ad, maybe I'll do a gazillion ads, right? Like I'll do a hundred ads or something. Uh, and so that's the first technique in kind of getting around this idea of, um, you know, um, of, of, of this tax or this overhead that I need to pay every time I do an instruction. And so here I'm showing the, all of, like from, from GPUs, what they were doing to get around this is that they defined all of these new instructions. So this one is half precision fused multiply add. So they would pay for a single instruction, but they would do both multiplication and addition in one instruction. And so now the energy for that instruction is, um, is a bit higher and the overhead is kind of still quite high, but then they created a new instruction which takes four of those multiply adds and puts them in a single instruction. So now the instruction becomes even more complex. And so this is a half precision dot product four. Uh, so this is doing a four way dot product in a single instruction. And now my overhead went down from you know 2000%. Uh, so the blue part is going down, not because the blue part is decreasing, but because the red part is increasing. I'm doing more computation with the same overhead. They haven't fundamentally changed GPUs in any way. They're just adding these more complex instructions. And by the way, the same is being done in CPUs where you have all of those AVX and AVX2 and SSE instructions um, that are also SIMD extensions of CPUs. SIMD meaning single instruction, multiple data. And that's the main paradigm in programmable um, computer chips um, nowadays. And then finally, they also have now this matrix matrix multiplication. So they're multiplying two 16 by 16 matrices in a single operation. They're like, well, why are we doing dot products? We just, just multiply the whole matrix in a single operation. And so now the overhead is actually quite small. The energy spent in the computation is, is a bit more uh, or much more than, uh, than what I spend in the overhead. And so, so now it's quite efficient. You can't really get much lower than that in terms of overhead, especially for a fully programmable device like a GPU. Um, so James is asking, isn't things like AVX 512 becoming more and more like paralyzed vector instructions for GPUs? Yes, it's becoming very similar. So you need to write uh, very kind of specialized uh, code that runs on a single chip and, um, and AVX 512 instructions they can't quite do 16 by 16 matrix small in a single operation, but I think they can definitely do stuff like dot products very efficiently uh, on CPUs, but, but they're converging basically. Uh, SIMD extensions of CPUs and uh, generally how GPUs operate, which is SIMD also, single instruction, multiple data. Um, and so that's the first technique. And I, I'll say in uh, the accelerator that we used to, uh, that I was working on at Intel, the deep learning accelerator, we actually just had a single instruction for convolution. So if I have a convolutional layer, I, my instruction looked like convolution and then it happened on the hardware. And so um, obviously it, it had many kind of parameters. So what is the size of the convolution? What is the size of activation and so on? So it was kind of what we call the VLIW or very long instruction word accelerator. But we basically took this idea of amortizing overhead all the way to kind of the limit. And we saw what is the biggest coarsest, coarsest grain operation I can do. And that was, you know, my compute primitive of, of a deep neural network. Um, and maybe I'll stop after this slide, but uh, uh, here we're, I'm kind of showing um, two generations of tensor cores on GPUs. And it's kind of showing you um, the number of instructions it's performing per second. Um, so here two things are happening actually. The first thing is that they created these tensor cores to do matrix matrix multiplication in a single cycle. So here you see, you have a 16 by 16 matrix on each side. 
and it's being multiplied in a single cycle to produce another matrix. Uh, whereas here, we're computing one row of this matrix or one column in every cycle. And the other change is that we now have an instruction to access these tensor cores to, um, to obviously do this um, matrix matrix multiplication in a single cycle. Uh, and if we look at the TPU um, on, um, on an ASIC, what, what they did is actually not, not a 16 by 16 matrix, but they have a 256 by 256 matrix multiplication engine. So now their single instruction does 256 times 256 operations, uh, matrix matrix um, multiplications at the same time. And so moving towards these coarser grained oper um, operations are, is definitely something that's happening uh, quite um, aggressively in industry. So uh, I will stop here because I think we're out of time. Um, but, uh, but I'm happy, uh, again, to kind of stick around for extra five minutes if people want to discuss anything. Um, you can just unmute and chat, or you can type in the chat box if you have any questions. Um, yeah, so, so yeah, thanks for kind of paying attention and, uh, and coming to class. So I'll see everyone next Wednesday. Uh, and like I said, I'll, I'll just stick around for another five minutes.